technical issues just now. Now we're going to continue with the next lecture on the basic ophthalmic surgical instruments by Dr. Alisa Victoria Ko. She will then proceed with a lecture on suture materials and needles after that. So Dr. Alisa Victoria Ko is an ophthalmology specialist with over 10 years of experience in the ophthalmology department. She obtained her Master's of Ophthalmology from University Science Malaysia in 2014 and is currently in her second year of vitreo retinal fellowship in Slayang Hospital. So I welcome Dr. Alisa to deliver her lecture. Hello, hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Alisa. So as you can see, the presentation is prepared by Dr. Zabri. And the next one will be by Dr. Hyrin. I'm actually presenting on their behalf as there will be, there's a third year part two exam today. So without further ado, let's proceed with the ophthalmic microsurgical instrument. Okay. So please, okay, Okay, I believe everyone knows how to hold a pencil or a pen, right? So in a ophthalmology, because we are doing microsurgeries, we, the, the grip that is involved is precision grip, which normally we use external precision grip. External versus in, uh, internal, why? What's the difference? The external precision grip, right? You can see that the whole is the, the the pen here right the body of these uh, instruments or whatever you're holding will be outside the eye but internal grip internal precision grip will be like this okay can you see that so this but i'm not going to talk about internal precision grip i'll be talking about this external precision grip as well as the microsurgical grip if you can see better. So, external precision grip is more than just a pinch, you know, pinch grip. When we talk about two point pinch grip, it's like pinching a pinch of salt, you know, this is how you pinch. But in an external precision grip, there'll be three point pinch involving the first three fingers. So, when you are holding a pencil, or your instrument in the external precision grip, your shaft of this instrument is actually resting on the staff box. Okay, so on top of this pinch grip, the additional points will be there's a knowledgeable patch in at the apex of this your thumb. Okay, the instruments will rest and roll if rotated with the fingertips. If you can see, I'm not too sure it's clear or not. And also, number three, you have actually support at the outer edge of your hand, as well as these two little fingers here. Okay. So, what is a microsurgical grip? Microsurgical grip is actually a modification of this external precision grip. So, in when you are writing, right? If you can see. In microsurgical grip, the hand will be actually supinated 30 degree from the writing position. Okay, and from the picture you can see, in the microsurgical grip, actually the tip of the middle finger is actually resting, and then you have your instruments in the uh, resting on the index finger rather than the snuff box. So it's like this, okay? So in this, uh, in this position as well, instead of being in the sagittal plane, the instrument is actually at the paracoronal plane. Okay, this is the microsurgical grip. So after we know about the Precision grip, that's a pasina. So, what are the instruments that, that we use in doing our microsurgery uh, in the ophthalmology? So, um, first of all, your, your needle holders. The needle holder should be appropriate to the size 
as a uh, of the needle. Excuse me. How to remove this from my presentation? I'll just put it out from my windows and Okay, sorry, let's resume. So we need a needle holder to hold on to all our needles, right? But make sure we choose the appropriate size of a needle holder versus the needle because if you have the huge one, it will actually block your view, it will damage the needle as well. So in microsurgery, we use non-locking needle holder. The next picture will show you um, different types of needle holder. The first one on top is a Barraker curve tip needle, non-locking needle holder. So um, non-locking in terms that you see it can lock this um, needle when you actually pinch it. But for this Aruga straight tip locking needle holder, which is uh, below here, you can see there's actually a locking mechanism. So you have to actually press it to lock and then to press it again to release the lock. So this locking and unlocking movement is very, um, actually it's a fine movement, right? But any movement in the eye surgery is actually a big movement. So we will need to avoid that, okay? So um, how to grip the needle? We grip the needle one third of the way from the switch end. So the switch end is the end where it's connected to the suture. Avoid gripping the needle close to the switch end because at this end, it is the weakest point actually, and then it is rounded. So it's easily, it will easily slip, number one. And number two, you may actually bend the needle when you are trying to suture, and also the, the sutures may uh, detach from this stretch end. Okay? The needle held in the jaws of the needle holder is perpendicular to the long axis of the needle holder, which I will show the picture later. And the jaws of this uh, needle holder uh, should face upwards. So, okay, on the left, you will see, okay, one third from the switch, one third of the middle length, which is from the switch end, this is the tip, and this is the wrong way of holding it, which is in the middle of the length of this needle. So, um, if pressure is not applied at the right angles to the needle shaft, which is a 90 degree just now, right, you will have a needle slippage. So when you're trying to enter the tissues, be it the conjunctiva or the sclera or the cornea, instead of entering at the correct angle, when trying to penetrate, you may actually, um, the, the, the needle may slip from this uh, needle holder. So next one is a tissue forcep. So the anatomy of the tissue forcep, the tip at the far end here, you have the shaft and you have this handle. So we have different types of tissue forceps. We have a smooth versus tooth forcep. So as you can see on the left, you have a smooth non-tooth forcep. This one is a, with a serrated surface. And on the right is a tooth forcep. So you can see at the end, I will describe further later on in the subsequent slide. So, what is the usage of this smooth forcep? It is to handle delicate tissues, like your conjunctiva. The serration on the grasping surface, as you can see, you have these uh, straight lines, you have the serrated ones. 
it is to provide friction actually without damaging the tissue. Imagine you have a flat surface, um, it's like your sole, you know, the true sole. When you walk, if you don't have you, if it's smooth, you can easily slip. It's the same principle. So when you're holding the tissues, these frictions provide um, grip, okay, without damaging the tissues. So the pattern of these serrations determine the direction in which the maximum resistance resistance is obtained. So you have a crisscross one, definitely they will give you more friction and better grip. Okay. So tooth forceps, you have we have this opposing teeth type or interdigitating teeth. So on your left, the first one, the pierce forcep is the opposing flat surface type. This is to hold on to skin. The right angle teeth and the forward angle teeth on the right, uh, the Bishop Harmon, as well as the Castro, Castro Viejo, they are actually uh, interdigitating teeth. So you see that two into one. Uh, this one is a uh, 90 degree. The tooth forcep is for precise grasping of tough tissues such as the sclera and cornea. So the surface where it grabs into the, uh, the, the tissue actually will mesh the tissues. Okay, this, um, tooth, uh, these tooth forceps are identified by the angle insertion of the teeth. This, 90, this is a 90 degree angle on the left and this angled teeth on the right is a mouth tooth forceps. So when you want to identify it, just look from the side and you'll be able to see this angulation as well as your 90 degree uh, tooth. So um, tissue forceps, the surgical forceps usage is uh, for manipulating very tough tissues such as the sclera, okay? And uh, to grasp the material which can be directly brought in between the blades. So number and orientation of the teeth actually affects the stability of fixation and tissue damage, which is quite logic, right? You have more teeth, it will be more stable, but there are more teeth, then there will be more damage. So uh, 90 degree angle teeth has better fixation, but greater tissue damage. If increased number of, of teeth, then there will be increased degree of tissue fixation. So um, when passing a needle through the tissue which is fixed with the tooth forceps, I mean after you have grasped the tissue, right? The forceps should be held such that the needle enters tissue on the side of the forceps with the best, greatest number of teeth. This is Edson forceps, uh, also in a acroblastic surgery holding out the skin. You see there are so many teeth on the tip, right? For better grabs. This is color brief forceps. I being anyone who have started doing any perigium surgery, etc. This is the most invaluable forcep for me, I would think. Why is it called colibri? Actually, colibri means that it's a um, hummingbird. Uh, okay, uh, if you know hummingbird, the mouth, the beak is very long, right? So like the, coli, uh, like the hummingbird for this colibri, you will see that at the tip, there'll be very fine tooth. So this is um, for fine uh, um, grabs, uh, grips. Uh, and then on this flat surface on the on the along the uh, before reaching the shaft, actually you can uh, hold on to your sutures when you are doing tying. Uh, as well as why is the um why is the shaft actually so um, delicate and as well as uh, long? This will enable a uh, better view during the stitching, uh, because it will not obscure our visualization of the tissue that we manipulate. So um, this is very invaluable. This is the Bishop Harmon forceps, um, two forceps, which is angled 90 degree. You can actually hold on to Vera, the cornea as well, as well as this Castro Viejo forceps. So this forceps doesn't have a two-in-one uh, fitting of this um, tooth, but uh, this is more delicate. Uh, it damages tissue less. Utrata is very important in our separate surgery. So as you can see, the tip at the end here is actually 90 degree to the shaft. So this pointed uh, tip is actually useful in penetrating the capsule, breaching the capsule, and you want to do a CCC. And also at the, at the sides of this uh, tip, you can uh, oppose them when you try to peel and create a CCC. So, 
Next, we go to time forceps. Also, very, I mean, most of you will have encountered this. Time forceps doesn't have teeth. Uh, they have a sharp teeth and then rounded side edges. Why is it rounded? So that uh, they will not cut through the sutures when you're doing your tying. This is thin and tapered, and the forceps keeps close precisely. This is how it should be, but I know many centers will have forceps that doesn't close precisely, right? <laughs> and you are forced to try to use it, but if you have, um, it, it, but they are supposed to close precisely, okay? And uh, it is not used to handle ocular tissues. Huh? IOL holding forceps, the Kelmans. Okay, this is how they look like. Actually, you have many brands in the market. Okay, as long as it can hold stable and it, it won't scratch on the surface. Huh? So, um, this table shows us the different type of forceps for handling different type of tissues. I mean, best for different type of tissues. The more failed forceps is your conjunctival forceps with a serrated surface and some with smooth uh, surface as well. And then uh, cornea, here we use colibri, which is tooth. Edson for skin, Yukata for the capsule, and Kelman for the IOL. Scissors. Scissors, how do we manipulate our scissors or how we handle it? It is a squeeze handle style. Uh, it's not like the scissors that you act with for microsurgery at least. Huh? So if it is curved tip, use it with the tips curving upwards to visualize the knot and the surrounding tissue. Because you don't want to curve it downward, then you will not know what you are actually cutting down there. The speculums, you have the wire type and the, this, this, on the left, this one on the left is thick. On the right here, you can see screws here. Actually, you can adjust the width of this uh, palpable aperture and you spread the lid open. Huh? And then, but most of the cataract surgery, we use the one on the left. Okay, but um, in uh, vitro retina, we will use the one on the right. I think um, with a cornea thing being transplant, they will have different speculums as well. So, of course, we still use some scalpel blades during our microsurgery. Um, this is the most commonly used, the number 15 blade, 11 blade, as well as the number 12 blade. So, you can see that um, I think you are, you are familiar with the top two, the one down there, right? You can see that the cutting edge is actually on the inside of the curve. Because um, when you are working in a in a, in a confined spaces during a DCR, we do not want to actually cut the surrounding tissues. So that's why it is facing in the inner surface. For so gripping the scalpel blade, you see on the left, the left is um, your external precision grip. Uh -huh. Okay. Have a better control and the instrument is resting on the Snuff box on the right is looks like a microsurgical grid, so you do not rest it on your index finger because the control because it will be um, the control will be less because the instrument is relatively larger. Huh? So again, we show you the precision grip. Huh? You can actually, I mean, most of us hold the pencil like the external precision grip, but of course, I've seen people holding. <laughs> A pencil like this, right? But that's how conventionally we hold the pencil, so there will be the external precision grip. Microsurgical grip, again, the one down there, more support from the middle finger with this uh, shaft of this uh, instrument resting on the index finger, and you have your thumb to actually twist or turn it around. And then um, it is better used for confined spaces and uh, manipulation. Huh? So a bit on electrosurgery, I believe everyone in undergrad school would have learned about this where there is monopolar cautery and bipolar cautery, but in ophthalmology we use a bipolar cautery. So the monopolar major surgeries, the surgeons they use because you have a pad actually which stays um, on the patient's body, so the, the current is passed through in a uh, direction through the patient's body and return to this generator. 
the for the bipolar country, you see, um, the so from this generator it comes to it. This is the time, uh, one part of it. So it will cross over towards the other time, and then it will return back to the generator. So whatever energy is produced is actually at the tip of this forcep where they are on the patient's uh, tissues. Huh? So it doesn't enter the body and then return to the generator. So um, most commonly used in our ophthalmic surgery, okay? The use is restricted to coagulation and the path is confined to tissue between the forceps. Having said that, that's why when you do cauterization of these uh, vessels during your ECCEs, etc., um, it's better to have a gap between it because the, the, the current actually uh, travels between these two kinds. Okay? For the bipolar forceps, many different types, different shapes, different curves, straight. Okay, and the uh, modes of tissue destruction is as shown here. Coagulation means uh, coagulation. Okay, uh, intermittent short bursts of high voltage to coagulate and charge the tissue and organism without cutting. Ours don't really cut, and then uh, also on the right, you can see the situation. So that's the first part of my presentation. I think we shall proceed with needle and switches next.